let me welcome Arthur Gretton. I hope that I pronounce all, both name and surname well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so Arthur is a professor at the Gatsby, which is nearby, Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit um, at uh, UCL. And he's the director of the Center for Computational Statistics and Machine Learning at UCL. Uh, I think everybody here knows him uh, quite well as an expert in uh, kernel methods, uh, but he does have quite a few other research interests. Uh, since recently, it seems like his design and training of generative models, uh, but I also have seen him presenting uh, uh, research on non-parametric hypothesis testing and so on. I was a frequent uh, visitor to the Gatsby seminar series while I was uh, first visiting uh, uh, Gatsby uh, during my PhD and then uh, later on when I was doing postdoc at the uh, UCL Neuroscience Department. So it's really uh, an honor to have you Arthur here. Uh, so let me stop here and well, you can start. So, well, thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, you know, I'm sad not to be able to be on the campus, uh, but uh, hopefully in happier times, I will be able to visit in person. Um, so I will talk about generalized energy-based models. So this is actually very recent work, um, although it's based on themes uh, that we've been looking at uh, at Gatsby over, uh, I guess, the last uh, couple of years. Uh, in particular, this work uh, was done by these uh, people who are appearing in the photos on the front slide. So uh, Michael Arbel, Nikolai Vinkowski, Dugo Sutherland, and Lian Zhou. Um, so they are, uh, I think, uh, the people whose work we will talk about today. Uh, so the theme of the talk is going to be one of training generative models. So at the high level, what this looks like is that I might have a set of samples, which I'll write as X, from an unknown distribution P. Uh, P might be a distribution that generates samples in very high dimension. Uh, in this slide, I've shown that by a set of pictures of bedrooms. Uh, and uh, our goal here is to make our own distribution Q, which is going to generate samples that will look like P. So on the right-hand side of the slide, I have a set of bedrooms which have been generated by a generative model. And our goal is to try and make the set of samples from P look as close as possible to the set of samples from Q. So to achieve that goal, one uh, important criterion is to have a loss function, a critic, which tells us how close one distribution is to another distribution. So here, I've written dpq as a critic from some category of critic functions. Uh, which is going to give a useful gradient signal to my Q, which is going to pull my Q towards my P, uh, make my Q samples closer and closer to my P samples. Um, so an important uh, theme of this talk is going to be to understand the function and design of these critic functions and to uh, perhaps even incorporate them into the models themselves. So here is the outline. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking a bit about uh, P divergences or F divergences and how we can get reasonable critic functions from uh, the feed divergences. So that will be the first part of the talk. Uh, then I'm going to talk about generalized energy-based models. Uh, so as you can see by the date on the archive, this is very recent work. Uh, this is only the second time that I'm talking about this in public, and the first time was two days ago. So uh, please uh, interrupt me with questions if anything isn't clear, and be patient with any uh, mishaps that occur in the slides. Um, if time permits, I'll talk about uh, integral probability metrics as well, which are another class of GAN critics apart from P divergences, um, and a little bit about gradient regularization, uh, which is something where we have observations, but we're a little bit lacking in theory, so it's a more speculative part of the talk, uh, but we might not get to that, so let's just see. Okay, um, so let's start with our divergence measures. So if we are trying to compare distributions at a high level, there are two ways that I want to think about that. Uh, one is by looking at, in some sense, a difference, P minus Q. So if P minus Q in however I've uh, chose to define this is zero, um, then I can be confident that P and Q are the same. Or I could think about a ratio of P to Q uh, in, in some sense. And if this ratio of P to Q is equal to one, then P and Q are the same. 
So these are sort of two different ways of thinking about how P and Q might be compared and how I might be confident that P and Q match. And these two themes give rise to two classes of uh, divergences. So on the left-hand side, we have the integral probability matrix. And these look for a function G in a class calligraphic H uh, here, um, which witness the difference in the distribution. So I'm looking for a function G from some well-behaved set of functions, which notices uh, where the difference in P and Q is large. So expectation under P of G minus expectation under Q of G should be big. And I'm finding the G from my class of functions that makes it as big as possible. So this follows the sort of the theme uh, of a difference in distributions. And on the right hand side, I need some form of witness for my ratio. So let's say that P and Q have densities with respect to Lebesgue. I take a function of that ratio, uh, phi, which is going to be convex. And then I take the expectation and the Q of that function. Now, if this function phi uh, is zero when uh, the input is one, then this thing is going to be zero when P and Q agree. So you can see that this is another valid measure of uh, divergence between P and Q. And we're going to spend the first part of the talk on this side of the slide uh, among the phi divergences. So phi divergences contain uh, a number of different divergences that I think you'll know. So KL, the famous one, Hellinger, chi-squared, Denson Shannon, reverse KL, and so on. These are all on this side of the slide. OK, so let's look at the phi divergences. So from the previous slide, we know it's the expectation under Q of phi of the ratio of phi to Q. Phi has to be convex for reasons we're going to see very soon. And phi of 1 is going to be 0. So that means that if this ratio is 1, then my phi divergence is going to be 0. The KL divergence is an instance of that. So for KL, I'm using phi of u as u log u. If I do that, uh, then I get, after a very small amount of algebra, the KL divergence, which is the log ratio of P to Q uh, expectation over P uh, rather than Q. So this is my KL. So a question is now, well, I've got a measure of divergence between P and Q. Is this going to be useful if I want to train a generative model, right? It's going to tell me that P and Q are the same. Uh, can I use it in training? Uh, so there is a fairly strong argument against using KL. Uh, in this setting. Uh, and this uh, is something that Leon Boutou and his co-authors have discussed quite extensively, uh, which is that it isn't very well behaved when the ratio of P to Q isn't well defined. So in particular, when P and Q are disjoint. So here is just a very simple example in 1D. I've got P, uh, which is supported around 0. I've got Q, which is supported around 0.5. They don't have joint support, so the ratio isn't well defined. The KL is infinite. And uh, the Jensen Shannon, which is another phi divergence, is log two. And you know, this isn't very helpful because let's say that my generator is improved and it's moving its mass towards the target. Well, unfortunately, KL is infinite still, Jensen Shannon is log two still. So I have no indication that I'm getting better. Uh, so I'm indicating this by this little cartoon fellow in the corner here, uh, which is like an angry teacher that always yells no at you, whatever you do, uh, if it's not perfect. Um, so basically, like, you know, my generator is getting closer to the target, but my critic is still just yelling no. Um, this uh, setting of disjoint support is actually very common in uh, many settings that we care about. So for example, if you're generating images, they occupy a quite low dimensional subspace in a very high dimensional pixel space. The model of our image also occupies a low dimensional subspace. Um, or some manifold in an informal sense. And the uh, intersection of these two supports is almost certainly over a set of measure zero. So this is the rule. It's not the exception to have this disjoint support. So it would seem that this is a dead end, like phi divergences are no good. Uh, and yet they are by far the most common uh, basis for divergence measures in GANs. So something seems to be working. Uh, notwithstanding this cartoon. So let's uh, figure out what's going on. What people do in practice in GANs is not necessarily to use a phi divergence, but they might use a lower bound on the phi divergence. Uh, and this lower bound might turn out to be a little more useful. So let's look at the phi divergence again, expectation under Q of phi of P on Q. Uh, 
I can represent phi using a variational form. Okay, so here I've replaced phi with this optimization over f, uh, where I've uh, replaced it with the ratio of phi to q times f minus phi star of f. So phi star is the dual function of phi. So you can think of phi star as a sort of slope intercept version of phi, uh, where I give phi star the slope, and then it gives me the negative intercept of the tangent where phi has that slope. So you can show that when phi is convex, you can write phi as this optimization here, um, where I have to use a different fz for every z. So for every z, I've got a different fz, which uh, solves this problem. And this is an exact equality. So if I use the fc uh, that solves this problem for every z, then I get an exact equality here, and I'm, I'm still with my original phi divergence. Where I might get a lower bound is if I replace fz with an f from a smoother set of functions. OK, I restrict my function class. So then fc, because it has to be smooth, maybe it can't uh, take exactly the value that it needs to take for this bound to be tight. Uh, so I get a lower bound on my KL. Uh, and you know, under what circumstances is this lower bound tight? Well, it's tight when I, uh, my f hits this f diamond, which is uh, within the subgradient uh, of phi at phi to q. So if phi is differentiable, this is just the gradient of phi at phi on q. So if my class of smooth functions contains the gradient of phi evaluated at phi and q, then the bound is tight. Okay. Um, however, even if the ratio of phi to q isn't well defined, I can still uh, find you know, uh, a solution of this problem, uh, which is a meaningful solution, uh, even though the, uh, the correct solution might be infinity, for example, in the, in the case of KL. So this is a useful lower bound if the upper bound is infinity. Um, okay, so let's actually look at the KL. So here is the KL, uh, log of P on Q integrated over P dz. And let's put in this variational lower bound. Okay, so I have this lower bound where I've used a smooth set of Fs. I've reparameterized slightly my function class here uh, for reasons that will make later slides in the talk a little bit easier to follow. Um, so I've got this minus EP of F plus one, uh, which is the expectation under P of my function, and then minus EQ of basically the dual function P star here, um, but with this reparameterization minus F plus one. So this is exactly the lower bound that we've seen in the previous slide, where phi star, we've just used the correct phi star for KL, which is this exponential here. Okay, when is this bound tight? Well, the bound is tight, when I use this f diamond here, which is, uh, remember, a derivative of p, so this is minus log here of p on q. So if the ratio of p on q is well defined, then I can define my f diamond, I can substitute it in, and my bound will be tight. So here is a nice illustration. p and q here are Gaussians, they've got different means. The log ratio is a line here. If my calligraphic h contains the straight lines, I can uh, substitute that in, and then I will get a tight bound on my KL. But the lower bound is still well defined, even if the ratio of p to q is not. So this is now the lower bound. What happens if I get samples? So I've got samples from p, my real samples, samples from q, my generating samples, and I want to compute this lower bound on KL. Well, I can just replace the population expectations with sample expectations. So I've got my expectation of f under my sample mean, expectation of e to the minus f under my sample mean. Um, and this is an empirical lower bound, an approximate lower bound on my KL divergence. Um, so we're going to call this a KL approximate lower bound estimator, or the KL divergence. So the KL divergence, the variational lower bound, is what uh, people actually optimize in practice when they're training GANs. And it might sound like the KL divergence, but it's actually not. It's a lower bound, and it's better behaved, as we're going to see. So let's see how the KL divergence, the variational lower bound, uh, behaves on the examples that we looked at earlier. OK? So here is from the previous slide. I'm optimizing over H, a class of smooth functions, minus EPF, minus EQ, e to minus F plus 1. I need a smooth class of functions. Uh, for the purposes of the next couple of slides, I'm going to use a reproducing common Hobbit space as my function. So these are smooth functions. When I compute the uh, KL, the variation lower bound, I'm going to use a smoothness penalty to ensure that I get a smooth function out. 
uh, by penalizing the RKHS norm of uh, W here. Okay, so we're going to call that the Kale smoothie. Here is the example uh, that we started with earlier. We've got here the red points and blue points. They're drawn from distributions with disjoint support. Um, but we can see that the variation lower bound, the Kale smoothie, here is not infinity, it's 0.18. Uh, and as the support gets closer, it's dropping, it's 0.12. So this lower bound is actually useful. It's informative, it's giving uh, uh, helpful feedback to my generator, even though it's a lower bound on a quantity that's infinity for these uh, blue and red samples. So the Kale smoothie uh, appears to be a useful critic uh, if I'm using it to train a generated model as opposed to my original KL divergence, which was not. So the cartoon form for this is like a friendly professor who's giving useful feedback uh, and instructing me that I'm getting better as my red approaches my blue. So it seems that you know, this is a win. Um, however, one also can uh, create difficulties for ourselves when we're using this smooth lower bound on the KL. So here is an example where this is uh, actually going to cause us problems. On the x-axis, I've got the KL divergence between two Gaussians, and I'm plotting these two Gaussians below the x-axis. So they're two Gaussians with the same mean, but as I move to the right along the axis, the variance of the red gets much narrower than the variance of the blue. So this you might think of as mode collapse. The fake samples are on a much more concentrated support than the real samples. And as I mode collapse, my KL is going to go up very quickly. Okay, because P and Q are getting further and further apart. It's still well defined, um, but you know, the KL is going to be very large. The issue is that the ratio of uh, P to Q um, is going to be a very non-smooth function in this case, and the log ratio is going to be very non-smooth. So if we're computing a variation of lower bound with a smoothness constraint, so the KL on the y-axis here, uh, that's not going to go up as quickly as the KL, which is on the x-axis. Uh, and this is a problem because basically like when I've got mode collapse, uh, I'm not penalizing that behavior as severely as I should under a KL. And so in a sense, like I'm not disincentivizing mode collapse as much as I should be because I've enforced this smoothness constraint on my function class. So this is one of the instances where uh, having uh, a smoothness constraint can cause me uh, trouble. All right. Uh, is there questions at this point, or shall I continue? Okay, I will continue. Um, so this is empirical behavior. Um, let's actually understand a little bit the topological behavior of this lower bound. Like, how uh, do we expect this to behave? Um, so we're going to make a few assumptions. Uh, we're going to assume that our domain is compact. Um, and we're going to assume that our set of uh, functions that we're using to compute the variational lower bound is dense in the space of continuous functions with respect to infinity norms. So it's a smooth uh, function class. Um, let's switch that off. Uh, but it's dense in the space of continuous functions. So it can get close to the space of continuous functions. Um, and we've also got another constraint here that if f is in the function class, then its negation is in the function class and its scaling is in the function class for some range of Cs between zero and some maximum. So if these properties are true, then we have that the KL is greater than or equal to zero and equal to zero only if P and Q are the same. So this is a, a powerful result, which is telling us that the KL is, telling, is, is informing us once P and Q match. Now, the criterion among these criteria that should at least uh, make you slightly concerned is this denseness argument, that we need our smooth functions to be dense in the space of continuous functions. Uh, so there have been some studies on the capacity of neural net function classes. Uh, an instance of a function class which satisfies this denseness requirement is, for example, the span of ReLUs raised to some power alpha, some integer power. Um, so the span um, of these uh, such functions would satisfy this smoothness uh, requirement. So this is one neural network class that at least uh, if, if, the, if the set of uh, red use uh, grows without bound um, is going to satisfy this uh, requirement. So this is telling us uh, that P, that the KL, 
uh, is zero only when P and Q agree. Um, but this also uh, doesn't really tell us how well it behaves when P and Q disagree, right? And one of the important properties that we wanted was that when Q approaches P, then Kale should go to zero in a well-behaved and, and uh, you know, well-defined well way. Um, so this is something that we're going to address now in this slide. We're going to add an additional constraint to the constraints on the previous slide, um, which is the functions in calligraphic H uh, have to have Lipschitz constant uh, L. If this is the case, then the KL uh, is going to approach zero if QN approaches P. So if QN converges weakly to P, if these, if these distributions converge, um, then KL is going to go to zero. So this is a nice property. If QN converges to P, my KL is going to go down to zero. Um, and it's going to sort of inform me that my Q is getting closer to P. And I can tell you uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, is behind this result. Here is our KL, our variational lower bound, so EP of F minus exponential E to the minus F uh, DQ plus one. I can rearrange this with a little algebra as EQ of F minus EP of F minus a term here where this inner term here is greater than or equal to zero. So the negation of that is less than or equal to zero integrated over Q. And so I can upper bound KL by EQ of F minus EP of F. And if this Lipschitz requirement holds, then this is itself upper bounded by Wasserstein one. And Wasserstein one metrizes weak convergence. So if P converges weakly to Q, uh, then KL is gonna be forced to go to zero. So this is to give you this idea that when P converges weakly to Q or Q converges weakly to P, then KL will go to zero. It turns out that it's an if and only if. So the other direction also holds, um, but I won't talk about that in the slide. So this is a very nice property of our variational lower bound, which was not true of the original phi divergence that we are lower bounding. So the KL as a, uh, as a function for training GANs is a better function than the phi. Okay, before I go on, any questions so far? Yeah, could you uh, just maybe give some intuition about the difference between the two things that you just showed, like one with the QN and the one without the QN is? Or? Right, so, Q, uh, so QN is, let's say, it's a sequence of uh, distributions that is approaching mm -hmm. P. So if we go back to our figure, Right. This might be the, the set of uh, reds, and we are uh, the, the set of reds is converging weakly to the set of loops. So um, even though they have disjoint support, they are getting closer, for instance, in Wasserstein 1. Okay. Um, we would like uh, you know, our critic function to drop nicely towards zero when this weak convergence occurs. And this is what we've established for the lower bound, for the ratio of lower bound. We saw earlier that that was absolutely not true for the KL, my, my original phi divergence, because as my red was approaching my blue, it was infinity, 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 infinity. It wasn't uh, very informative. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I will uh, now talk about generalized energy based models. Um, so to introduce generalized energy-based models, let's first remind ourselves of how we train our GANs, okay? So we are now introducing another ingredient to the mix, which is a student, our little student here, um, our generator. And the generator is gonna generate a set of uh, samples. Uh, in this case, uh, it's gonna try and draw some dogs. And then I have my set of dogs, I have my set of real dogs, my critic is gonna compare the set of fake dogs to real dogs, and is gonna give feedback to my student. And then this is going to iterate uh, until we reach some sort of equilibrium. So either the student stops improving or the critic uh, is no longer able to tell the real dogs from the fake or, you know, for whatever reason, uh, we reach an equilibrium uh, and at that point we stop. So this is how we train our GAN. But what do we do after we've trained our GAN? Well, we take the critic, we throw it in the trash, and then we keep the student and the student goes on generating its samples. But in the process of doing that, we're losing information because remember our critic function, if we're using a feed divergence, it has a, a function that tells us where the real and fake samples disagree. Now let's say that at the end of training, that function isn't perfectly flat. 
that means that there is still a respect in which the generator samples and the target samples don't agree. Like the generator is putting too much mass somewhere or putting too little mass somewhere else. Um, and the critic knows that that's going on, but we've just thrown away our critic and we've lost that information. So a question now becomes, could we find a way to incorporate the critic uh, into our model after training to get better samples? And this is what motivates uh, the uh, new uh, model, which is this uh, um, uh, generalized energy-based models. So to describe them, we're going to first of all have to remind ourselves what a generator is doing in GANs. Um, remember that in GANs, a generator is not an explicit model. Okay, so I don't have you know, my P of my samples in closed form. Instead, what I do is I take a noise uh, in low dimensions and I pass it through a bunch of neural net filters to get out an image in high dimensions. Okay, so I generate my noise, I pass it through the filters, I get my image. So this is the form that my generator needs to take. And however I define my model, it needs to function in the event that my generator takes this form. Okay, so now uh, let's define the set of models on the slide. I'm going to write my uh, generalized energy based model as Q B theta E. Okay, so Q is always generator. Um, it's going to incorporate B theta, which is my classic generating uh, generator from GANs, uh, and E, an energy function. And that, that part is E. Okay, so the generator part, the B theta part, um, that functions exactly as it did for GANs. Okay, so Q theta, which is my generator distribution without the energy function, uh, is, is, is obtained. Uh, by drawing Z from eta, a known distribution, like a low dimensional Gaussian, passing it through B theta, that's my bank of neural net filters, and getting out my X, which is my image, my badly drawn dog. However, that's not the end of the story because now I'm going to take uh, the output of my generator and importance weight it, okay? So I've got this exponential family model, my energy model here, E to the minus energy uh, over Z, where Z is the integral of my energy function with respect to my generator measure, okay? So one can uh, understand the F here, this energy function, as a right on nicotine derivative of Q with respect, uh, QB theta, uh, sorry, QBE, which is my uh, final model, with respect to Q, which is my generator measure. Um, so this is in a sense like, you know, the density with respect to this generator measure. Um, if the generator measure is Lebesgue, if it has a density uh, on the domain X, then this is just a normal energy-based model. But we're interested in the case where the generator is supported on a much lower dimensional submanifold or subspace uh, of my higher dimensional calligraphic X. And here the F is you know, the density with respect to the measure on that support, on that lower dimensional support. Okay, so it's, it's more general than an energy-based model. Okay, how do we fit this model? Well, we're going to use a generalization of the log likelihood, um, which you know, basically looks like the log likelihood. So it's the integral of the log of FQ uh, E, which is my, my um, energy model, with respect to P, my real data, okay? Um, which is with, uh, if you remember from the previous slide, the negative expectation of E with respect to P minus log of the partition function of our model. This uh, generalized log likelihood uh, is the donska varadan lower bound when the KL is well-defined. So let's say that I have a ratio of the density of P to Q. Uh, let's say that's well-defined. Uh, then my energy function, which maximizes the lower bound, is the negative log of that ratio. Um, and then I just end up getting my KL between P and Q again. Okay. So if you just recall, the donska varadan is uh, a lower bound in the KL in the sense that it's expectation under P of the log of my energy model divided by Q rather than expectation under P of the log of P on Q. And you know, the bound becomes tight when E is equal to minus log P on Q. So it reduces to something we know uh, when the ratio of P to Q is well-defined. However, uh, we can still define the generalized log likelihood and fit it when P and Q have disjoint support, for example when they're mutually singular. I can still optimize my generalized log likelihood. Um, so this is the model class that we're considering. Uh, this is the paper in which we discuss it, generalized energy-based models. 
the team at Mila uh, have also, uh, at the same time as us, uh, proposed pretty much you know, the same idea using, uh, in their case, uh, Jensen Shannon rather than KL. Uh, so I urge you also to look at their paper. They have some really nice insights, which I think are, are very valuable. Um, so we pretty much arrived at the same ideas at the same time. Um, we have also the code. Okay, so let's look at these ideas graphically. Let's say that we have a distribution uh, which is on a 1D, man 1D submanifold in a two-dimensional space. So I'm plotting here the support of that distribution. Okay, so the support of this distribution is this wiggly line here, and you can see that it's a one-dimensional submanifold on this 2D plane. And I have some probability mass on this 1D line. So here I'm uh, applying some probability mass in blue uh, on this 1D plane. And this is my target. So let's say now that I've uh, trained a base function, a Q theta, uh, which is my implicit generative model, and we'll assume for the purposes of this uh, figure that it managed to get the support correct, okay? So it's actually managed to match uh, correctly the support of my blue model. However, it has the mass on that support incorrect. So it's placing too much mass here, it's placing too little mass here. Uh, so it hasn't quite got the mass right, even though it got the support right. Now, in again, this is where we would stop. We would take the red and we would run with it. With the generalized energy base model, we go further. So we basically uh, do an importance weighting of this red sample so that it gets closer to the blue target. And you can see that the green is closer to the uh, blue target in that it's uh, putting less mass here, it's putting more mass here than the red was. So this is the image that you should have in your head when you're thinking about how these uh, generative energy base models work. Okay, so we now need to fit this model. We have a generalized likelihood. We need to now uh, find a way to fit things. And there's multiple things we need to fit. So the first uh, is the energy function. We need to fit that. The second is the base, right? We need to train that as well. And finally, once we fit our model, we need to sample from it. So how do we do that? Okay, so those are the things we're gonna talk about in the next slides. So let's first think about how we learn the energy function. And remember the energy function uh, for a given base Q is the function that optimizes this generalized log likelihood. And the challenge here is the log partition function. Okay, so that's going to be troublesome when you're going to optimize generalized log likelihood uh, over E. Rather than uh, optimizing the generalized log likelihood, what we're going to do is we're going to maximize the lower bound on it, which is going to exploit the conca concavity of the logarithm. So here I've got my negative log, it's upper bounding uh, this expression here, minus c minus e to the minus cz plus one. So this is a uh, straightforward bound to get. You just take the tangent to the log at zqe and you evaluate that tangent at a point c. So the bound is going to be tight when c is equal to zqe. Let's replace that now into the expression. And now we've got a lower bound on the generalized log likelihood, uh, which is you know, uh, the expectation of minus e plus cdp minus e to the minus e plus cdq plus one. I'm going to call that calligraphic f uh, over the function class e plus r. So calligraphic e is the class of energies, and the reals are the constant c. And this bound is going to be tight uh, when c is equal to the log zq. So basically when I solve for E and C, uh, the C that will be my solution is going to be my estimate of this log z. So this is pretty nice. Now let's look at this expression here. You should be getting flashbacks to earlier in the talk because this expression here is the KL, the variation of the lower bound on the KL, okay? We've made a particular choice of function class here, which is the energies plus the constants. Um, that's because we want to have this estimate of log partition. In the event uh, that the ratio of P to Q is well-defined and we get the KL, um, then this C star is just gonna be equal to one and these two expressions are gonna coincide. However, uh, the KL with a general function class and the KL with the E plus Cs are going to be a little different uh, when the ratio isn't well defined. And we want to use uh, this function class here because we need to worry about uh, getting 
the estimate of the bug partition in our model. Okay, so now you can see how it is that we've incorporated the critic function into our model. This is the critic function from again, and we've put it into our model, and we're taking advantage of the fact that this energy function is not going to be perfectly flat, you know, in most interesting cases. Okay, we uh, fit our energy function now, and you know, it, it's straightforward to compute from samples. You just can replace P and Q with sample expectations as we saw earlier. Now, what about the base measure? So remember that the base measure is this implicit model here, okay, where I've taken my Z from a noise distribution, I pass it through a neural net, uh, and out comes my X, okay? So for conciseness of notation, I'm gonna define my calligraphic K as my KL divergence, my variation lower bound uh, between P, Q theta, which is the distribution uh, parameterized by this implicit model here, with respect to my function class. Now I want a gradient that I can optimize over theta for this calligraphic K. Uh, it turns out we do have an expression for that gradient, um, so the details in the paper, uh, but this gradient here is my Z, remember my Z from my previous slide, which we learned, uh, derivative of E star, which is the uh, energy function that maximizes the KL from the previous slide, um, of B, derivative theta B, et cetera, okay? So this is the expression for the gradient. What happens if I use E, which is not E star? Well, then I'm gonna get a biased gradient. Um, so that's, that's going to be the effect of that. Um, and in practice, we do more steps for our energy than we do for our base. So when we alternate energy and base training, we do a bunch of steps for energy, then one for base and, vice, and, and so on. Um, there are some conditions which are required for this uh, to be well-defined. And they're basically smoothness uh, con conditions, uh, both for the energy functions and for the base measure. So if my energy functions are parameterized by C here, uh, then C needs to be compact and my energies have to be jointly continuous with respect to the parameters of C and X and smooth with respect to X. Likewise, my generators have to be jointly continuous with respect to their parameters and the noise Z, um, and there needs to be also some Lip Lipschitzness constraints. So if we have smoothness for our energy class, and if we have smoothness for our base class, for our generated class, then this gradient can be proved to be well-defined almost everywhere. But you know, this doesn't come for free. We need some smoothness requirements for that to be true. Okay, so we can do gradient descent for theta. We can learn our energy. We've learned our model. How do we sample from it? So that's the next slide. Okay, we've got our end-to-end -end model. So that's Q, which is a function of our base measure, our generator, and our E, our energy function, um, where we call that X is B theta of Z and Z is drawn from N. So X is an implicit model. And we've got this uh, importance weighting, uh, which contains our energy. So if this is our model, what would be the expectation of a function for samples that are drawn from that model? Okay, so here is my function X and I'm integrating that with respect to my model, well, what it would look like is I would have my e to z, b would transform that z, I would importance weight it, and then I would compute my g at that uh, point. So I can therefore define my posterior uh, over z, over my latent of my uh, generator uh, in the following way, which is e to z, and then this f uh, function here, my energy function. So how would I sample from my z's? over the posterior of my Z's. Well, I would just use my favorite uh, Langevin derived algorithm, MALA, HMC, uh, and so on, um, to get these samples Z, okay? So these are now the posterior over the latent space of my generator, okay? And this posterior is including the information contained in my energy function. So it's now incorporating the information that I know about where my samples from my generator alone and my samples from my target don't agree. And once I've got these samples Z, I just pass it through my B to get my samples X. And these are better samples. Okay, so now we've learned our model and we're able to sample from our model. Are there questions at this point? Um, hi, Arthur. Mm -hmm. uh, Vincent, nice to see you again. Um, Good to see you. <laughs> Uh, I think I lost you along the way. I thought it was clear at the beginning when you introduced this uh, energy function, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm 
I don't understand what this support uh, X here, uh, and uh, what I, I don't know how you map to the late from the latent to the observation. Uh, I got I get confused now that you have a distribution that depends both on B and and E, and I, I don't understand how and what it is. And uh, I get sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's uh, uh, have a look. So let's say that I've got Z from. Uh, so let's let's first start with the generator. So this is just an ordinary GAN generator. Um, it takes a, a, a variable in the latent space Z, um, which is just from some standard distribution, and it maps it through a neural net uh, to get X. X, uh, or calligraphic X, is my space of images. Yeah. Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if, if I were just training again, that would be all that I would do. Um, however, uh, I would like to, uh, let me just go back a couple of slides. Um, uh, no, too many slides, right? Um, I would then like to take uh, those uh, images um, or, or this, this uh, distribution, and I would like to tweak the probability mass on it. Okay, actually maybe the, the best way to see it is on this, right? So this red is, is what I got from my GAN. So it's placing mass on, on the support, on this low dimensional support, um, but it's placing too much mass in some places and too little mass on other places. So ideally what I would want to do is do some importance weighting to push down the mass uh, around this part here and to push up the mass around this part here. So the support is still, still imaged and you want to shift support? the... Yep. Yeah, uh, so exactly. So I'm not, the, the uh, next step, the energy function, does not affect or touch or do anything to my support. My support is given by my B theta. Um, all that it does is importance weighting on that support. Cool. Okay, um, and this is where we have an advantage over GANs because a GAN would be stuck. A GAN would say, okay, I'm done, I'm trained. Here is the red, this is as good as you get. Um, and my critic is still saying, no, no, you haven't got it right yet because you're putting too much mass here and you're putting too little mass here. Um, so we use the critic function as an importance weighting, um, which pulls the mass down here and it pushes the mass up here. So maybe where I, I lost you is uh, um, you can you describe it as, oh, you would train again and then plug a plug the critic into energy-based model and it would give you this nice feature. But in the end, you do train the whole thing together as a single generative model. And this is where I don't see where it, and you try to make connection. Uh, I failed to get the connection when you were trying to then link to the loss of a GAN versus the, uh, mm -hmm. all these uh, approximate uh, or lower bound on your loss along the way. Right, yeah, so no, you're absolutely right. So basically we, we alternate uh, uh, in practice uh, training the support and training the uh, critic uh, right. or the energy function, uh, just as you do with a GAN. Um, so basically, uh, the, the training procedure really does look like a classic GAN training procedure where I you know, like adjust my mass and then I'm going to use my critic function uh, to tell me how far I am um, and then I'm going to adjust my critic and you know, alternate uh, these two things. Um, the critic function is going to use a particular class, um, right? Uh, oops, which is, um, uh, let's go back. Right, the critic function, uh, which is, is like, this is my, my critic, my GAN critic. And this is exactly the KL, the uh, variational lower bound on the KL divergence from before with a particular function class, which is like these sort of smooth energy functions plus a constant. And we separated out the constant because we've got this sort of log partition function that we need to deal with if we want a nice lower bound on our likelihood. Um, but you know, this is still a valid critic function. It's still a variational lower bound on the KL, um, which we can optimize uh, to pull uh, the Q towards the target P. Um, so basically, you know, we fix the Q, we compute the energy, we then fix the energy, we adjust our Q, we alternate these two things, um, and eventually we get a model where we've trained both our Q and our energy. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this is, but you know, the important thing is having trained our model, a traditional GAN would then take this E and trash it. Uh, but we're not going to do that. We're going to basically uh, end up with a model here, um, which is, you know, using our uh, X drawn from our B theta uh, 
but then reweighting it according to the energy. Um, and, and this is going to be better uh, in the event that this energy function isn't perfectly flat. If it's perfectly flat, then my Q is brilliant, it's great, and I, I don't need it. But that never happens. Do you have any uh, uh, additional uh, issues in training uh, with the variance when you have samples um, having this particular parameterization or? Uh, a very so, superficial question, but uh, since you yeah. Added, yeah, I mean, in a sense, like the the thing that tricked us most uh, in the initial stages uh, was the fact that we were better off doing this lower bound. Um, the reason for that is if you use this original donska varadan form, you need to compute this thing for every mini batch, and that actually blows up the variance a lot. Um, it doesn't work very well at all. Whereas here, if you have a C that you sort of update. Uh, you know, online from batch to batch, uh, then this is much more stable and this works much better. So that's, I think, a very uh, important and non-trivial thing that we discovered uh, in implementing this. Cool, okay. Yeah, so are there any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, so yeah, so basically, you know, we have this, this model, um, which we can sample from. So basically, you know, the way that it works is we get the, we sample from the posterior of the Z, which is the input to the generator. And then we take these posterior samples, we pass it through the generator. And this, this gives us our samples. And these are much better samples than if we sampled from the prior, right? Because a, a normal GAN would just sample from the prior over the Zs and pass that through the generator. Um, and this isn't gonna do as well as using the posterior that we get from this energy-based model. Okay, so now um, I have some samples here. Uh, the purpose of this uh, is to illustrate basically the uh, convergence of the sampler. Um, so here we're using like a Langevin uh, and Monte Carlo sampler. Um, we're running it at a lower temperature basically to force it to get stuck on a mode um, because that's giving us good quality images. Um, so that's uh, fair enough. Um, and so here, what you're seeing is sort of like the sampler uh, running through a few iterations and getting stuck on a horse or a goat or a car or, you know, various objects around the domain. Um, the important thing is like, you know, we didn't use like enormously fancy generator or critic networks here. Um, but the, the point that we are illustrating here is that if you combine your generator with your critic, for a given generator and critic architecture, you will always get better samples than if you just use the generator. So basically, like, you know, however complex your generating critic is, you're always going to do better if you keep your critic than if you don't, which makes sense because unless the critic contains no information, it's still telling you where you should adjust your mass to better match the target. Um, so this is something we found very systematically across like many different data uh, examples. Um, it's also really fun to do something that you can't really do with the GAN, uh, which is actually to run it at a normal temperature, so at, at shall we say, ground temperature, and to watch it uh, move from mode to mode. Um, so here are some traces of our sampler where it's sort of like you can see it exploring the space of different images. Um, and this is actually really nice. We've got like, you know, a, a genuinely a generative model over images, uh, which is uh, jumping from mode to mode and finding different images over the space. Um, it's also a little bit uh, reassuring in the sense that uh, you can see that it's not just, you know, memorizing images and putting out the images it's memorized um, because it's showing images here as it moves between modes that are clearly not, uh, you know, uh, physical images. Um, though once it moves to high probability uh, regions, these uh, become more plausible. Uh, so this is our sort of GAN sampler uh, using this uh, energy-based model. Okay, uh, are there questions about the sampling uh, process? Um, okay. Maybe one, one quick sure. question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How does that help with the, how good does that help with the mode collapse problem in classical uh, image problem? Right, uh, so in a sense, uh, it depends on whether one like mode collapse might either be a bug or a feature. So um, it's a sort of question of like, what uh, do you want your model to do? If you want your model to give you very sharp images, 
then it might be good to run it at a low temperature, which is then very concentrated around modes. Um, and if we do that, we get like very high quality images. Um, if you want something that sort of explores, uh, you know, that, that draws samples from your model, um, then you want to run it at room temperature. Um, and so this is sort of like, you know, so if you want to sort of explore your space and find uh, the set of images that you've got, you might want to do that. And then you might, you know, at some point want to basically start dropping the temperature and getting it to focus on one image and generate that image really well. So some GANs uh, have noise uh, at different level of the hierarchy. Could, mm -hmm. you, could you envision like uh, having a, some high level variable where you, you don't want uh, mode collapse and then refinement where you don't use your technique on the rest of the noise or? Yeah, I mean, at the moment we just have like one knob, which is this temperature. Um, but you can, uh, like, if you sort of think of a uh, latent space for your generator, you can be pretty creative uh, about this. Like, all that we've uh, sort of said is, like, given a generator, you should use your critic function as part of your model. Like, that's the message. Um, and so however you've chosen to set your generator up, that should still be helpful. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. So I think we are uh, uh, at a little short of time. So maybe uh, what I can do is just give uh, a couple of words on integral probability metrics. Um, so integral probability metrics are a set of metrics which are of a quite different uh, category to feed divergences. Um, so these are looking for well-behaved functions that maximize the difference in expectations under P and under Q. Okay, uh, and so you know, remember that feed divergences they they were all about ratios. Uh, integral probability metrics are all about differences. I want to find you know a nice function that maximizes the difference in expectations. Um, Wasserstein and MMD are functions in this category. MMD is maximum mean discrepancy. Um, you'll notice that these two balls, though, uh, have a very tiny overlap. Uh, just uh, for your information, the only thing that lives in that overlap is the total variation distance. So there is only one uh, metric on distributions that is both an IPM and a feed divergence and that isn't trivial. OK. Um, so the idea of the IPMs is that you're looking for a well-behaved function that maximizes difference in expectations. So basically, like, these two sets of samples are closer together than these two sets of samples. Um, and so the question that one uh, has when defining an IPM is, what is my class of well-behaved functions going to be? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just skip through um, some uh, parts. I'll just give you quickly um, what the MMD looks like. Uh, so this is this guy here. So basically, like the MMD is one IPM where I take, you know, kernels. I put kernels on my blue. I put kernels on my red. I sum all the blue kernels together. I subtract all the red kernels, and this gives me my smooth function. Okay. So this is one well-behaved smooth function that uh, is a witness to how blue and uh, rather different. Uh, so now a question is, if I'm using an IPM, an integral probability metric, rather than a phi divergence for a GAN, how good is that? How well behaved is that? Okay, IPM is in practice. Let's go back to our example. I've got P and Q with disjoint support. Let's first start with a classical divergence measure, um, which is what's the time distance. So if Q and P are getting closer, how does the Wasserstein behave? So it turns out that Wasserstein uh, W1 in this case, which is the uh, uh, case where you're using uh, functions of Lipschitz on bounded by one as your uh, functions for the IPM. This is a really, it's an, a, a nice teacher. So it's this friendly teacher here, oops, which is basically going to decrease in this case from 0.88 to 0.65 as my red approaches my blue. Um, so the Wasserstein one is a good critic, a good teacher. Now, uh, what about MMD? Well, MMD, uh, let's uh, use it with a rather smooth kernel. Uh, 
MMD also seems to be a good teacher, right? So here is MMD, and MMD uh, is going uh, here from 1.8 to 1.1 as my red goes towards my blue. So it seems that this as a critic function would be a good critic function. It would give helpful feedback to my students. What about if I use a very narrow kernel? Well, here uh, it goes down, but infinitesimally, right? And so here, you know, it's 0.64 and, and change. Here it's 0.64 and change, but the gradient signal that I would be giving my generator uh, in this case would be very small, even though my red has approached my blue uh, quite a lot. Uh, so if I'm using an IPM, uh, and if I'm using MLD in particular, uh, the kernel that I choose might actually very much affect the uh, quality of the algorithm that I get. Nonetheless, there is for MMD some very nice uh, theory, which is that it does uh, metrize weak convergence. So if Q approaches P, and if I use a rich enough RKHS, uh, then uh, MMD is uh, guaranteed to go to zero. Um, this requires some conditions on my kernel and on my space. Uh, and this result came out in a, in a very recent paper. You can see 16th of June. Um, we it proves uh, after a great number of years that indeed MMD uh, does metrize weak convergence. Um, so it is going to go to zero nicely as to approach as P. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will give a useful gradient signal to my generator. Okay. Um, and indeed, you know, MMD was proposed a long time ago as a critic function for GANs. In fact, shortly after the original GAN paper, um, but the quality of the images that you got out of the original MMD GAN paper were not great. Um, and you know, this have ultimately comes back to the fact that you might be in this sort of scenario uh, and not in one of these scenarios. Okay, so um, basically, you know, not, not to go into detail, um, but the punchline is that you need some way of enforcing that you're in this kind of regime and not in this kind of regime. And what we found uh, to do that um, is a sort of gradient regularization strategy. Uh, let me just show you that. So basically what we do is we scale our MMD by a quantity which penalizes the gradient of our kernel over the support of our real samples. So what that amounts to doing is saying, my MMD function should stay reasonably flat as I move around the set of plausible samples, but as I move away from that, it's allowed to be steep. So it's a problem-specific uh, smoothness constraint. It's a domain-specific smoothness constraint. Um, and this is the constraint that we used and which others used as well, like the wasserstein gan gp paper, um, to end up getting a critic function which is informative for our generator and helps our generator to improve. Uh, so are there questions about this idea? All right, so in that case, I think now, uh, is a good time to go to some pretty pictures, which we got from, so this was basically, again, using MMD, using this uh, gradient regularization trick, trained on ImageNet uh, without labels, and you get uh, pictures that include a dog and a Stonehenge and something in the sea and other fun things. Um, but GAN papers always have to end with image pictures, so we are doing that. Um, so yeah, so basically the two things I've talked about, on one hand, the generalized energy-based models, uh, which incorporate the critic functions if you're using a p-divergence and always give better samples than using the generator alone. Um, and I also encourage uh, people to use a data-dependent gradient regularizer uh, if you're training again. And this is true whether you're training again, uh, in fact, using an IPM, which is the example that I gave, uh, but it's also applicable when you're using a p-divergence and everything comes with code. So I will take questions and uh, encourage you to drink the kernel beer. Great, let, let me thank Arthur and hope others will join me. Uh, that was a great talk. And yeah, uh, everybody feel free to stick around for follow-up uh, discussions. Uh, yeah, if anybody has questions, Please do. Uh, it was too clear.
I will also scroll to the post credit scene. Does it uh, show a visible advantage over the usual training with uh, GANs? So you show um, us that it mm -hmm. produces nice, nice images, but in comparison to uh, non-generalized energy models. Ah, right. So, um, right. So this is sort of going back to the uh, GVMs. Yeah. So effectively, like you know, what what we show here. Uh, effectively is that, you know, we have a critic, we have a generator. And uh, if you incorporate the critic information, um, in our experience, we always got better samples. Uh, because the generator, like, in a sense, you know, the generator is uh, a model of limited capacity. Um, so it's doing its best both to get the support right and to get the mass right. Um, but here we're allowing the energy function to do some of the work. And so it's like, you know, uh, the energy function can sort of see that even um, after your training, the generator isn't always putting mass where it should, um, and the energy function corrects that. So it's even visible to the naked eye. Um, well, so uh, the uh, I, I say you're you're sort of saying like uh, is the images visibly better? Yeah. Um, so here. Like I, at least they were visibly better to us. Uh, bearing in mind, though, uh, we are using pretty crude uh, generator networks here and uh, critic networks. So um, I think if you want better quality images, uh, then for sure the Montreal group have made more effort to refine uh, the models they use in generation and in uh, critic network. Um, and they will also, they are also getting you know an improvement. Um, so you know here we we get a visual improvement, but it's kind of trivial because the images are not great to start with, and so you're getting a much better uh, set of images out. Um, whereas yeah, in in the uh, uh, I mean I think in in all cases that I'm aware of, whether it's our case with a very simple critic and very simple generator, or the Montreal guys, which have a much more sophisticated generator and critic. Um, the images do improve if you include the critic information, um, both in like FID score and visually. Um, and you know, I, I would say that again, like it, it makes sense. Like as long as your critic function isn't zero, isn't flat, um, that means that your generator is still getting stuff wrong. I guess it's it's a bit difficult to quantitatively compare them because you're using different loss measures, right? Uh, so when you say we're using different loss, so the loss uh, that we use is this FID score, um, which is in a sense a heuristic, right? Because you're taking the poultry layer of inception as your features and inception has been trained uh, for classification. Um, and then you're computing a uh, Wasserstein uh, distance, assuming that the distribution of these coefficients is Gaussian. Uh, I have argued elsewhere that uh, there is a better measure of distance um, which is the kid score, uh, which is the kernel inception distance. Uh, but uh, sadly, I have uh, not managed to convince the wider world uh, of that. So we are going to use FID because everyone agrees that FID. Um, okay, I missed that. Nonetheless, well, you know, I'm unfamiliar yeah. with FID scores and all that. Yeah. So basically, all FID does is it says like, take my my images, uh, compute uh, some off the shelf. Uh, image uh, features of them, um, and then compare the distribution of those image features for the generator for the critic, assuming that those image features are Gaussian distributed. Okay. Which is actually not a disaster necessarily, but um, you know it's an assumption, and that's that's what FID does, um, and so it seems to be at least not uh, completely detached from. Uh, what we physically think uh, is a better or worse uh, image. Um, certainly, it's a better option than earlier measures like inception score, which uh, needs a classifier. Um, but uh, it's not perfect. Like you know, the the uh, issues of sort of troubleshooting GAN images, like that. There's a lot of work in that direction. Uh, but here, we just wanted to use uh, something that the community accepted. Uh, for our okay thanks <laughs>
Um, I will say also that we, you know, in the talk I talked about image generation, um, we've also done other density estimation benchmarks. Um, so in the event that we are using some other um, base measure, uh, which in this example, we used NVPs as base measures, which do have a density, um, we can also get uh, better densities by taking the NVP and then uh, using an NAG function on top of that. Um, and for these, like it's, uh, you know, these, these are density estimation tasks. And so we then have, um, you know, a, a likelihood measure that we can compare, which is a much more, uh, I, I think, uh, unambiguous and, and accepted uh, way of judging quality. And again, like we, we always improve over the NVP. So you start with the NVP and then you use an energy model on top of that and you can do better than you could the NVP alone. Uh, does anybody else uh, have any questions? Okay. Well, I think then we can uh, stop with the recording and call it a day. We have some uh, follow-up uh, individual meetings. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's let's move on to that.